It is March the 1st. I am inordinately excited about this because this is the harbinger of melting season. And I don't know about you, but I have found this particular uh, winter to be the most disruptive. My schedule is a joke at this point. Uh, all the people that I'm trying to see, thank heavens that they're flexible. Um, I'm having to move them around depending on what storm is moving in or has wreaked havoc. Um, today, we're going to talk more um, and we're going to elaborate on um, the different variations of consistent, available, present, reliable, caring, um, caregiving, because it has many faces and many varieties. It's not all just about mothers, thank heavens. But before we start, I want to um, tell you a little bit about uh, something that is happening right now, and that is about the uh, Bewin, listen to the name, the Bewindi Community Hospital Neonatal ICU CPAP Fund. And uh, yesterday I spent the better part of the day um, setting up a PayPal account. Um, now, I hope there's no confusion because um, I have to um, route it through um, the existing uh, business uh, mm -hmm. system. Um, so you're going to see um, virtual consulting if you choose to participate and donate anything. I don't, it won't matter if it's $5 or whatever. Um, we'll get there. Um, you're going to see virtual consulting. I'm trying to get Braden to be able to go in and um, customize that to say the Windy Community, blah, 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 fund sponsored by Birchall Consulting. We're not there yet, but um, that should be up, hopefully, with, if it isn't by the end of the podcast today, it should be up by within 48 hours, I think, just in case we run into any glitches. All right. So one of the things I also, and it's going to be on the home page. So that landing page, when you open up hoarding.ca, that's where it's going to be. Um, and you have my word that every single cent that we uh, raise um, is going to go to uh, that fund. And I want to list for you, just so you understand, um, we had an original quote, okay, um, from, I won't even go into that, um, we had an original quote of anywhere from 14 to $23,000. And I thought, ooh, that's not going anywhere fast. So I did a little research and I found the factory where most of these are produced. Um, it's in China. Um, but that same uh, device is exactly the same device that was being quoted at anywhere from 14 to $23,000 per unit. So I contacted the factory in China and we had a little talk and um, they are offering the unit with a one year warranty for $1,900 US. All right. So, and when I spoke to China on Sunday morning, the person I'm my liaison, Danny Yang, um, he told me that they are also um, going to include for each unit a device that costs for no extra cost that costs six hundred dollars. Uh, for, and he's they're going to include one of those for each. We're going to be sending um, to at least two, hopefully three CPAP systems. Um, 
And I've got a picture that's going to be on the artwork that Braden is um, creating right now that shows you everything that's involved there. We're going to be including um, two to three additional bassinets for the uh, ICU baby, uh, preemie uh, baby uh, unit because they only have two for the whole hospital and there are lots, lots more babies. Um, we're going to be getting um, a suction machine um, specifically for the unit, the ICU, neonatal ICU unit, because there's only one for the entire hospital and it's not ever located in the preemie uh, unit. We're going to be sending them um, an infant resuscitator. They don't have one now. So if um, the work that they're doing on the baby at the time isn't successful, there's no backup. Um, hopefully we're going to be able to send them um, a generous year or two supply of supplies that they will be using because it will be difficult uh, they're not going to be able to go through that other provider at those prices. Um, that's just not even, a, that's not a starter. Um, and it's very difficult to get things from China. They have to come by air, which is very expensive, and they don't have the money, or C, um, or courier, which is like, you can just forget about that with the money. These are people, families that are living seriously on five dollars a day all right um so we're, we're all budgeting these days right but this is a special level so enough said i just want you to know that every single cent uh will go to um go to the fund all right let me find my material now here okay so today we're going to talk about the benefits developed from secure attachment and positive caregiving, because we've given a fair amount of time, including last week going through um, an assessment tool on how it can go wrong. Let's talk a little bit about the positive side of it, because to some degree, even if parenting was less than what it needed to be. There were times when we did receive caring um, attention. Um, and so we can build on whatever the secure attachment experiences, even if they weren't an everyday thing. Because remember I said last week, those are the, th those are the experiences that stay with us for life. We can unlearn and um, develop st uh, strategies and skills and abilities to mitigate the insecure attachment. Our brains are living organs and they are capable of change. So we're gonna talk about regard the fact that regardless of age, all right, um, positive caregiving, no matter what age it happened at, positive caregiving promotes the development and the reinforcement of our inner sense of security based on our inner sense of self-esteem. Positive caregiving also prevents us as adults defaulting into, anybody hands up here, automatically being a people pleaser, all right? And someone who's consistently trying to win the approval of others. Many of those others, however, all right, actually have little or no interest in being pleased. And they, they are far more likely to be motivated and interested in the attention that we are focusing on them. Now, if you remember, we did a whole series of segments on podcasts about narcissism, 
All right. And you don't have to be a 100% narcissist and tick every boxes, every box, sorry. You can just be someone who's on that continuum. Um, someone who would rather receive the attention than give it. All right. So these next multiple statements that I'm going to read to you um, are not meant to insinuate that mothers can't do the same thing as fathers. But when there are two present, reliable, caring caregivers, you get exponential benefits. All right. And it doesn't have to be every moment of every day. So what we're really trying to underscore here is that when a father is added to the mix of consistent caregiving, all right, he is more likely, all right, to be um, an additional exponential boost to children growing up with a greater sense of resilience. Does anybody here or has anybody here ever experienced running out of resilience? Anybody? <laughs> I think we all have to put our hand up to that one. All right. All right. And having the father as a co-caregiver helps reduce the risk of mental dysregulation. Maybe because you have two parents at whatever time to go to, two parents to instill and uh, support the messages around us being able to self-regulate, all right? So there are studies that show um, that there's an additional benefit when dads are in the mix that impact the likelihood being far lower of illegal drug use, all right? And also lessen the likelihood that suicide um, is considered as an option to resolve crises. It's also, the list goes on and on, um, is likely to reduce academic inconsistency resulting in failing grades. So if you look at a child's life and any and our life as a child, maybe our siblings' lives, maybe we made out all right, but siblings didn't, all right? Look at what the factors might have been because we can be injured by association. It is also very costly to children, um, no matter what age, to watch a sibling fail as well and suffer and be at risk and live out these other risk, risky behaviors. All right. So it also, um, Glenn Shiraldi uh, wanted us to know in the workbook that boys, boys in particular seem to do particularly poorly in broken homes where fathers are absent. All right. Now, remember, it can be a present father or it can be a present father substitute. Could be a grandfather, could be um, a stepfather um, being present. Boundaries and behavioral control, self-respect, and responsibility are far more likely to become impaired if the father is absent. Maybe because, I mean, I've often said this, it takes two people to have a child because it takes two people to raise it just to do the work. All right. It's not that mothers, because plenty of mothers are single parents. It isn't that it can't be done, but it's a two person job with one person at the at the wheel, which means that you can't you can't expect the same energy. You can't expect the same uh, amount of focus. You just quite often don't have it 
while you're trying to meet all the other uh, practical requirements, right? Anybody been in that position? So if any of these things have gone wrong in your family growing up or the family that you had and raised and you were you you had a, a partner present, but the partner wasn't that caring, wasn't that available, wasn't that focused on being a co-parent in a practical hands-on way. I want you just to take whatever sense of guilt or responsibility you feel, loss maybe, for what might have happened with children, um, the challenges they might have had, the stumbles and falls they've had. I want you to factor in. We're talking about a situation where I don't know what the odds are these days of that kind of co-parenting being reliably available. All right, look at the number of challenges we have all had over the last, what, two, almost three years. Life still keeps dealing things and we do the best we can. These are studies about situations that were black and white. It's interesting information um, and I want you to have it because the degree to which you had secure attachment is the degree to which these are more likely to be uh, experiences that were present in a positive way, all right? So having consistent, secure, available uh, uh, caregiving also helps us develop a cohesive moral compass and to set boundaries. Those boundaries, they're not just about behavior, they're also about boundaries for ourselves. When boundaries are directly related to the ability to self-regulate, is there anyone here who can't reliably say that when they make a, um, a plan, they make a realistic plan, not just in what they're going to try to accomplish, but also in the timing and the persistence of that activity. Anybody? Anybody have difficulty with that? I'm hearing a lot of people say that. That is, that is in part a boundary issue, that you may have pretty good boundaries with others, but do you give yourself the same respect by having healthy boundaries with yourself? Or do you overestimate what you can do, what you can take on? All right. Do, are you trying to keep too many balls in the air? All right. And then not feeling that good about yourself when you can't pull it off. And then you have to remind yourself. These are things I'm hearing from you. You remind yourself, oh, there I am again. I'm such a failure. Maybe not a word failure, but I'm such a, you fill in, you fill in the blank there. All right. This is about boundaries. All right. This is about boundaries. Behavioral control. When Glenn Shirell is talking about behavioral control, he's talking about what I refer to as self-regulation. Self-regulation. If you can develop, all right, three things in your life, healthy enough boundaries and limits for others and yourself, you can work at making a plan and goals that actually are realistic. They're not idealized. And you can chip away at those in a deliberate, consistent way. And then you can be kind and compassionate to yourself when you get it, when it doesn't work all that well. But you go back because you have resilience. You fight for resilience to go back to the plan and pick it up where you left off. 
pick it up where you tripped. All right. And with respect for yourself and kindness, you're not saying, oh, that means I'm this negative thing. Just set that aside. All right. Okay. Now, we talk about empathy, all right, being um, an important, um, is it a skill, empathy, or is it, a, I don't know, I don't know what I'd call empathy right now, but Whatever empathy is, all right, it starts at home. All right, it starts at home. Don't be giving things away that you don't apply to yourself. All right, because are you setting yourself up to be outward, having an outward locus of control? An outward locus of control is when you give it away, but you don't save enough for home. Why? Because you are, you are looking at the other for validation and for, am I okay? Is that okay? Are you happy? Am I a good person now? Whatever it is you're looking for in doing that, I want, and we will be doing podcasts on inward locus of control, not external, but internal locus of control. It's really, really important that we start to really firm up our internal locus of control. Otherwise, remember what I just said, otherwise what happens is that to some degree, and it feels pretty good when other people are validating us. We're far more likely to repeat, 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 repeat. All right, when it feels good, right? But then we're depending on them for our own self-esteem. How's that going to work? Can you see that even if somebody is kind, even if they are gentle and they're responsible and they're loving, that is never a good idea to specialize in. That is never a habit that is good to really major in because we are looking outside of our own values, our own understanding. Nobody understands us like we understand ourselves. We're looking outside ourselves. How many people here find themselves susceptible to doing that? I'm happy if the other guy's happy. Mm -hmm. How often, I want you to reflect on that because this is part of this, all right? This whole secure attachment foundation block that we build on. How many people do that in order to get stress and something else that is not positive off your back? How many people look at the other uh, look outside and think if they're happy, I'm happy because they're not, they're not on my back. I don't have anything hounding me. I don't have anything negative to deal with. There isn't a foundation piece for misunderstanding or, or judgment or criticism or whatever. How many people do that? How many people think that having maybe one or two podcasts on developing an internal locus of control might be a good thing. I will start putting it. <laughs> Somebody just about fell off their chair, <laughs> waving their hand. That's so funny. I love you guys. <laughs> I get so much feedback from you guys. It's just wonderful. I look forward to being with you on Wednesdays. So I'll start putting that together. I will start putting that together. Okay. So how many people <clears throat> find that um, they have a hard time um, challenging themselves. They'd rather they'd rather stay in the safe zone. Okay. Right now, take your paper and pen, and I want you to write down two reasons: a positive reason and a negative reason, or another reason. If you have if you have a seven positives, that's okay. But I want you to write down what what you get for doing that 
What do you get for doing that? Because we always repeat what we get something back from. That's, it's not, it doesn't guide everything we do, every movement, every choice, but it's usually the most seductive. What do you get from not challenging yourself? I had a very wise person this week say that an EMDR specialist challenged her and said, I won't say exactly what the what can't was, but what do you get from saying you can't? Well, more importantly, from saying it, from believing it, from buying into it. Do you have two things that you get from saying I can't, believing it, acting on it? Because you know that whatever confidence you have, whatever self-esteem you have, you erode it. I want you to think that you have a supply. We all have a supply on a good day. We've got quite a bit. On a bad day, well, you know what? Seems like there's a leak in the system here. Um, but whatever you have in the way of self-esteem and confidence, when you say, without trying, without trying to make a doable, reasonable plan, to overcome whatever the I can't is, what do you get out of it? Okay. I want you to put that in the chat box, please. All right. Because if you're always saying, or you regularly go to, I can't, you're failing to give yourself the opportunity to overcome usually a fear, okay? Usually it's a fear. Nobody says, I'm sorry, I can't accept that check for a million dollars. All right, nobody does that. Okay, so it's 99% of the time associated with a negative, a fear, um, maybe an insecurity about being good at something, good enough. How many people here are perfectionists? And they're likely to say that if I can't do it as, if I can't get an A plus, I don't want my name associated with it. All right, watch that, watch that. Because you are all, in my opinion, brave, capable people. You show up here every week and I get feedback from many of you and I know some of you personally I've worked with you or I am working with you and I know that you face challenges I know you do and if you're showing up here every week the reason I say you're brave capable people is because you're leaving your mind open to the possibility of Hearing and learning something that you can attach to and you can build from there. You're builders. You're builders looking for the right material. All right, the right tools. Okay. One of the things that I just, as I said that, I half, this was actually Hafsa's idea. Um, yay, we have that. Um, I'm wondering if um, for a nominal fee, uh, all money's going to Bewindi. You can see I'm a little bit obsessed there. Um, I admit it uh, until it's concluded. For a nominal fee, um, how many people, just put it in the chat box, you don't have to say now. Um, how many people would be interested in, say, um, a three-hour a three um, workshop on probably a Sunday because a Sunday, and it would have to be an alternate Sunday because on, um, on the other Sunday, I'm driving to Mississauga to my practice up there. Um, so alternate Sundays, I get a day off. Um, how many people would be interested in um, say a three-hour workshop for, you tell me, 
you tell me what you want to uh, contribute. I, I won't even set a price and all prices will be acceptable. Um, where we get together on Zoom um, and I pick a section that is not um, out of the workbook, this ad adverse childhood experience workbook. One that is not um, heavily evocative. I don't want to trigger anyone. And then at the end of three hours, you're still in a state of alarm because we've triggered something. Um, just let me know if that's something that would interest you. Okay. And it would be Zoom. It would be about three hours, no less than. Um, we can have as many people as are interested, you set the price, um, and I'm I'm accepted. I will accept whatever um, you say, and you know that all of that money is going to go windy. Um, and we work on a segment that is doable, that helps you take something away that you then can use from that workbook. Just let me know in the in the chat if that is of interest to you. Okay, now we've got a lot of other information about all the goods that having two caring, particularly with fathers. You, we all, you know, let's not let's not um, dismiss it or minimize it. Having you, you don't have the same relationship with both parents. I, I've never known anyone who had exactly the same positive or negative experience with both parents, all right? So, and then there's, there's the variation of, you know, temperament with temperament, personality with personality that needs to be factored in. So, but... If you have two parents who are available, um, what did you take away right now? Take your pen and papers. What did you take away positively and maybe, maybe in the gray zone, okay, or negatively from mom, your relationship with mom? Now, I want you to look at from the beginning until kind of the end of being a child, all right? Um, if, if any of you have parents who are cognitively um, impaired now due to age or injury, that's not something I want you to factor in, that sadness, that loss. Positive and negative. And the reason I ask you for a positive and a negative, I want you to realize that balance, balance, seeing the positive and the negative makes that person real. Canonizing them, all right? You know what canonizing is? That's when you, you get to be a saint. We're all, we're all not candidates. All right, so now look at dad. Now, if you didn't know your dad, but you had a dad um, substitute, that's okay too. In that role, what positively? Not what are their not what are their qualities and their deficiencies? Experience your experience with them. What did you take away? One, I'll give you an example. Um, I didn't have the same relationship with both parents. I had good parents, great parents, but one was easier than the other, all right? Not because they were a pushover. Um, so if I have to, one thing to say positive about my mother, I would say I remember very, very firmly one time being really confused and discouraged and frustrated. And what well, I think I was sitting at the kitchen table trying to do something. And probably homework, probably math. And um, I heard my mother looked over at me and said, Elaine, settle down. You can do whatever 
you set your mind to. And I don't know what was special about that day. All right. You set your mind to it, you're going to do it. That's who you are. All right. You can do it. I was maybe, maybe 11 at the time. Okay. I wasn't a baby. Um, but that one, I don't know what was special about that day, but I think I have a brand somewhere on me that says, yeah, you set your mind to it. You're going to do it. All right. The negative of my mother would be that she was very particular about how you presented yourself. And I'm going to share a little secret with you. I love seeing you guys on Wednesday. But the one thing that every week I think, do I really have to do this? Is when I have to put this makeup on so I don't scare you. All right. I'm joking because under the lights, I am so white. See this paper? I would fade out into, well, yeah. I, that's why I painted that wall blue so I don't fade out. I am so white, I just blend with. All right. And you guys would be saying, Are you not feeling well? If you saw me in person, it'd probably be okay. But under the lights, sorry. So that's, that's my little negative. And you know what? I wish I was free of that. I wish that I could just not hear my mother's voice saying, really, you want to be remembered that way? All right. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about that you care. Expectations generally are, are you living those expectations? Sometimes, even in advanced age, you don't escape it. All right. Okay. That's okay. It's not harming you. My father, my father was the person who gave me his time. I had a terrible time. Not that I couldn't, if I, I discovered that if I don't understand the concept behind something, which was a blessing to discover that, if you don't get the concept, you are not going to understand this because I can't file it away so that I can use it. What is true for you? So my father is the one who every night after working all day as an officer in the military, okay, would sit with me. He, 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 my mother and parent, my mother and father had twin beds and he'd be, my mother would be watching television and my father would be lying beside me, kind of propped up and he'd be going through the math with me. All right. Every night, no matter what, no matter no matter what his day was. You don't think that was a gift? Huh? All right. And on the negative side, I guess the takeaway is that you know who you are. You know how to behave. You know what's expected of you. And it doesn't matter whether anybody else will ever find out or not that's what you're responsible for not that's what we expect that is what you're responsible for and sometimes that's a heavy load all right sometimes that's a heavy load what about you what were the positives take away from mom what were the negative take away from mom what was the positive take away from dad what was the negative takeaway from dad? The reason I want you to do this is because I want you to look at it now. And I want you to ask yourself, in absentia, most of us here today, probably our parents, if they're not gone, are, are elderly. All right. Are you still being bound in how it how are those positive and negatives takeaways that form your values your beliefs your confidence your expectations of yourself how are those working for you right now because that is the living legacy of secure and insecure attachment and don't kid yourself, you can be in your 80s. Attachment is attachment. It's 
So I want you to see the mix. Okay. How many people here in the balance um, would say that in the balance, it's working out on the positive side? How many people would say, you know, I'm still tripping over that. I'm still tripping over that message. Now I want you to write a summary statement. Whichever side of that equation you came down on, I want you to write a summary statement of what can I do about the legacy? What can, is there anything that is a hiccup? Is there anything that is still painful and is more likely to get in the way when you feel vulnerable or tired or overwhelmed? Because those are the kinds of messages that come to your mind that feed whatever the feeders are that result in hoarding. Do they cause it? No, but they feed it. They feed it by sucking away the positive energy that you need to have your environments exactly as you want them to be. Given the truth that we all space and time and energy is finite. And resolving the, the hoarding or the clutter, whether it's mental, physical, emotional, the combination, all right, requires enough of all three of those time, space, and energy. Everything that sucks your self esteem. Everything that feeds I can't, even if it's not about clutter. I want you, you know, I'm, I'm looking at a shelving unit here and, an, and a vision and an image has just come to my mind. You know those, um, what are they called? Infinite, infinite whatever. You can plug the little hoojiggy in and you can put the shelf on it and you can move it infinitely. You've got little holes all the way down the whole length or height of the of the shelving unit. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Somebody nod, please. Okay, because I'm I'm running out of words here so, to describe the hoojiggy. Um, I want us to picture ourselves being a shelf that we hold our life on. All right, and I want you to look in this imaginary shelving unit of life container of life and I want you to go how much space do I want for the good of life all right now the good of life is the thing in my, my definition what is your definition is that on my last day on this earth when I think about it I'm going to be really happy that I had it I did it I whatever all right everything else short of that is lovely um, or not so lovely but you know it's not essential to life and many of our possessions fall into that. How much space do I want for the good in my life? So imagine that you're taking that little hoojiggy that sticks in, that the shelf sits on, whatever it's called. Well, I wish I was more technical. Um, and I want you to imagine where on the height of that shelving unit you want to put the hoojiggy to put your shelf of life that you can always, always, always count on. I don't know about you, but I would want, I'd probably want three quarters for myself, 
all right? Just, just in case, just in case I ever needed to. Now, look at the positives and negatives of the takeaway from your experience with mom and dad. And I want you to ask yourself, of that space on the bookshelf that you are setting aside for the, the good, the happy, the joyful, the positive, and the contribution that makes you feel satisfied, I want you to figure out how much of that space do the positives and negatives occupy? Do the positives of the takeaway from secure attachment, do those positives actually give you more space for the happiness of life? Are you using them in a way? Look at, look at the specifics of what you wrote down. Did anybody write it down? I see some nods. Okay, look at it and say, does that make positive space in my life? And if it's not making positive space in your life, what can I do to convert that positive into more joy, more fun, more meaning, less oppression and stress and judgment by the buildup of things that I have. Now look at the negative takeaway from your relationship with your mom and your dad. Do the same thing. Are those negatives still on your back? I worked with someone this week who isn't present and I won't, I won't identify them. And I don't think in the August will be 22 years that I have specialized. I work one-on-one -on -one with people. I don't think I have ever seen or met someone who had more injunctions sitting on their shoulders. All right. I don't think we could complete three sentences before there was another like serious injunction. We're talking major interference. It was like static from the voices of the committee. And there were two members of that committee, mom and dad. They're long dead, but they are still, they still have the reins. They're still, I don't think we had three sentences. So you can imagine how many, look at your positives and negatives. Now look at, look at the negatives now and ask yourself, those negatives, if they were personal judgments or they were expectations that you had to be perfect and you know what, anything less than isn't good enough because whatever it was, ask yourself, are those still playing out in my life? Are they? And if they are, to what degree? They had their chance and they weren't perfect either. All right. They had their chance. They have no business in a negative way being on your shoulders being in your head. And now when you look at, and that's insecure attachment, all right, inconsistent, not kind, not available, maybe way, way, way too available for some stories that I've heard, all right? Now I want you to finish this sentence. The energy paper and pencil. If the negatives are still a factor, either all the time or when you're especially tired and vulnerable and not feeling that confident about yourself because something's happened, all right? 
what can you do to mitigate? You're not going to end it all at once. That, that is unlikely. Don't set yourself that task right away. Now, if it's possible, that's one thing, but highly unlikely if it's still with you. What can I do? And let me give you a good starting point. And this is not meant as humor. I was also explaining to somebody I was working with this week that in the absence of being able to figure it out in my head, I quite often talk to myself and verbalize it. Now, I think I made a joke about this before. Do not do this on a bus. All right. But I, I talk out loud to myself. And the reason I do that is because I then can um, judge and maneuver what I'm trying to work out using all the senses I have rather than just my brain. All right. And I, I can hear myself. Sometimes I have to say to myself, really, Elaine, really? That's the best you can do. And that's not the committee. That's me. Really? You know, that's not accurate. You know, that's not not fact. Why does it feel that way? And then I can dig back a little, peel back and look at what has happened recently that maybe has set me up for being off track in my thinking. And I say, okay, what do you know to be true? And that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to figure out. What does it look like? What does it feel like? All right. What can you do if that negative takeaway from mom or dad is still with you or crops up at inconvenient times? Anybody got some ideas? I'd love to have it. Oh, I've got 52 in the chat box. I'm going to love reading that after. Okay, now let's have a look. Um, one, of the, one of the principles that I live by, and I encourage people to consider adopting to whatever degree it works for you, is when you're shaky, when you're not so sure, all right. And that happens to all of us. Never go to fear. As soon as you feel the fear, stop it. Stop it dead in the tracks. All right. And say, what are the facts? Never go to fear. Go to facts. Now, I don't mean to be it, but that was the principle that made me when I almost choked on a $23,000 quote per unit. All right. And I thought, whoa, well, that takes us out of the game. And then I, I said, this is how I work. I, I did the verbal thing. I thought in a pig's eye, it takes us out of the game. In a pig's eye, no. There has to be another way. Okay, there has to be another way. And I started calling other hospitals to see whether they have a system where before the machine is actually not suitable, they rotate and they might we might be able to do it that way. And then um, that led me, I, I was, I'm the world's worst typist. I probably mistyped something. And the universe said, I'll give her a break. Okay. And I was typing and up came this medical, it's like a, a clearing, not a clearing house, but like a brokerage kind of for medical supplies. Uh, I, I looked at it and thought, where'd you come from? And then I thought, oh, that's interesting. That's what I'm doing. Sometimes the universe sends you some a little bit of help. And I looked and I thought, huh. And then I, I thought, oh, my gosh, look at all the companies. And then I, I immediately thought, OK, let's find out if there's a German company or a Swiss company, because we know the Germans and the Swiss do things 
really, really the specification. I don't mean to diss anybody else, but that's my bias. And then I, I couldn't figure that one out. But I saw one over here and it said pigeon. All right. I want to give them a plug. And I thought pigeon. Pigeon. And so I opened it up. And there was a there was a you know, tell us what you're looking for box. None of the others had that. They had the big website. They had, you're going to get lost in it. And I thought, what have I got to lose? So I sent off a message. And within about two hours, I got a message back saying $1,900. And because I specifically said Uganda, what I found out, and, and then I thought, oh, you know, I'm not sure. That's not sort of a. And then I'm talking to myself out loud. And this is not about, about this fund. This is about how you how you work your way through it, talking out loud to yourself. And I thought, check the facts. Don't dismiss it out of hand because you know the other's never going to happen, 23,000. And so I sent them an email and I said, I'm looking for blah, 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 for a remote hospital in Uganda. Thank heavens I added that because they created a price of 1900 and I found out on Sunday and I had a little lack of confidence in the company because of where they are and I did encounter a little bias in myself and then I'm talking to Danny Yang on Sunday morning from China and I said um could we get a deal on the on the uh, oxygen blender um, compressor, uh, air compressor, oxygen compressor, at machine. I said because right now, literally, they're using the system they have depends on basically a Coke bottle, a plastic Coke bottle that's about that big. I told you about this before, half filled with water with a tube in it and the seal being white white uh, medical tape. And he, his eyes went big and he said, actually, we're including the compressor with the machine, even though. It, and then I looked, he had sent me his inventory of accessories and things. And I flipped while he was talking and I thought, that little beauty is $600. And they're going to include one of those at no extra cost per why? He said, because my boss and I talked about it and we figured that in Uganda, uh, in remote areas of Uganda, you can't count on the pressure. You better be able to create your own. And at that point, I thought to myself, you know, that little lack of confidence you had in the reliability and the, the humanness of this a, a business that does this. I thought that we, we're now at 75%. I would have confidence that you're whatever. All right. How do you work your way through the conundrums that you have right now? Have you ever tried talking to yourself out loud? Hearing yourself, feeling the impact as though you're having a conversation with someone, it adds an extra dimension. And I find that it helps me find my truth and discover what is the underpinning of any insecurities or lack of confidence or not sureness that I experience because we all experience it. You need some fighting tools, all right, of your own that respect who you are, what you believe to be true, and what you want and need out of life, your life, not the committee's life. All right, good. So I'm going to sit now and I'm going to look at all those chats. And I did see some people said, yes, they were interested in that. And um, I just, um, 
I will look at my schedule. All right. Um, there may be a tiny delay of a week of maybe two weeks, maybe three weeks before I'm able to do that um, because I'm headed up to, I want to share this with you. Braden will, will uh, edit it out. Um, I'm headed up to Milton. I have my, I have another sister and she is 80 and she has severe Alzheimer's and she has stopped eating. She is refusing to take her medication and um, she is sleeping around the clock. So I'm going up tomorrow and I'm going to spend all day Friday with her um, because she's 80 years old and she's built like my baby finger. I mean, she's the tiniest little thing normally. Um, I think she's choosing to leave us. So uh, I have shifted my schedule around, which means I don't have Sunday. And then next week on the Tuesday, um, I'm acting as a subject area expert on hoarding for a human rights tribunal hearing for somebody who had a very um, inappropriate um, handling of and has taken it to the human rights tribunal. So I'm going to be, I'm not an advocate for them. I am a subject area expert for hoarding so that they can understand better uh, what reasonable accommodation looks like under the law. So it will be whatever the next Sunday after that is, that would be the first possible. But stay tuned. I will be in touch and it won't happen before next Wednesday. So I probably will have it figured out by then. Okay. You take care, everybody. Make it a great day. Make it a great week. We'll see you next Wednesday. Bye-bye. Can you do it? Yes, you can. Yes, you can.